Winston. Tyler. I think How's we're going, live, man? brother. Yeah. Going good. Another week, another deal. Yeah. Another week, another deal. This one's interesting because I recently visited this market, um, I don't know, within the last month. And, you know, I didn't know about this. I didn't go by and see the actual building itself. But it's super interesting because this, this is a great market. So I'm excited. Um, all good on your end? All good, man. All good. good deal. Just coming Let's back from uh, jujitsu practice, so. Now it's time to get back in the in the real estate game. <laughs> have you got have you gotten your black belt yet? Not yet. Another give me give me six months to a year. Six months. All right. I'm gonna put it on the calendar. Cool. Right. <laughs> well, um, I'll let you get started, man. Uh, how do you want to start? Okay. Out? Do you want to? I mean, do you want to talk about guy post Montessori, Cedar Park, or how do you want to dive into this? You want to look at cash flows well, already? We can, or? We can, yeah, we can talk about guidepost Montessori. So what, what we're doing is discussing, uh, this is actually the second Montessori school that we are, are talking about, and it's the same operator. Um, <clears throat> so same, sa basically same concept and guarantor, but just a new market. And looking at my notes here, you know, you've got 100% year over year revenue growth with guidepost. You've got uh, a 600 million valuation in October of 2022. Uh, they're saying that's doubled since I think February of 2021. So you're looking about basically a billion dollar uh, Montessori school operator. They operate um, over a hundred Montessori schools, both in the U.S. and abroad. Um, so this is a large operator, right? I mean, this is. They they know what they're doing, you know. They've got I think it's you know highlighted 100% year over year revenue growth. That means that they are operating, uh, they're opening new schools and operating uh, really quickly, right? Um, so so I'm assuming, and I think it's safe to assume, um, although you do want do your due diligence, that this group uh, is a very good operator, right? Um, well, let's see what else we have here on on them. Uh, there's I was the largest say, operator in the world, and uh, they've got enrollments up 235% since March 2020, which I guess that's good. So they took out COVID, right? So they took out compared to March 2020, and they're comparing it today. So uh, what were you going to say? I was going to say this is so just talk a little bit about, about these guys uh, with over 100 locations. This is their third location actually in Cedar Park. So Cedar Park, oh, wow. they've they've basically been just operating the hell out of it. They've got two locations fully booked, and they went and made the, got this third location, and it's already you know it's it's starting. I think the lease starts now in March, and uh, it's already fully booked. So they you know have seen the opportunity. They obviously know what they're doing. They have they're operating 100 plus locations. Um, they saw the opportunity to have a third school and operate it in Cedar Park. So you know that's interesting. At, at the very least, it's it says that you know Cedar Park. With which we, you know, we've looked at extensively um, in other in other business that we're doing. Um, you know, super high income area, very very fast growing suburb of Austin, Texas, um, and this group is just, you know, uh, now they're tripling down on it as a as a market for the future. So, um, you know, super interesting asset, super interesting location. I love the location, Cedar Park, everything we've, we've seen about it so far. Um, I guess the only the only question we will try to answer is. Amazing location, a great operator. Does the price, you know, is the price great? So, well, let's look at you brought the location up. Yeah, you want me to you want me to pull them up? Yeah, yeah, just pull up the mat. We'll we'll talk about that. Um, Cedar Park was yeah. great. You know, I I drove it and uh, I didn't spend too much time. I spent about an hour, and you know, it's clearly. A really nice community outside of Austin, Texas. Um, very strong community, and and definitely a place that we're looking to potentially put a client as well. Um, you want to you want to allow me to up? Yeah, sorry, I'm talking too yeah. much. Yeah, so I mean, there's you can see Cedar Park where that uh, where that dot is, right? So it's Austin, Texas. You know, one of the fastest growing cities in the U.S. Cedar Park is in North Austin, pretty close to Round Rock. Um, 
you know, you've got Round Rock, Leander, Cedar Park. These, this whole area here is extremely high income. Uh, I think Cedar Park is in that one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollar a year range uh, for median household income. So, you know, very wealthy community, extremely fast growth. Land is very expensive. Real estate's very expensive. So, of course, this asset is going to be you know more expensive, um, you know, than a lot of other places. But I mean, we'll we'll dig into that. Um, do you want to do you want to talk about Cedar Park at all anymore, Winston? Some of maybe. No, I, I think we're fine. I think everyone gets it. We like Cedar Park. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this asset, just uh, real local real estate. So they actually have so Montessori uh, Guidebush at Bushy Creek right here. This is their their first or second location. Um, this kind of you know local area. You have this gymnastics club, uh, a lot of kids stuff uh, around here, and then this is the new location. So the first thing you might notice about this new location, and we'll get into this in a bit, is it's significantly smaller than this one, right? If you, you know, real quick, just want to look at that. The oops, one is about uh, 18,000, whatever, it's like 15, 16, 17, 17,000 square feet. And this one is 4,000, the one we're going to do today. So it's, you know, less than a third of the size of the current Montessori school. Um, if you compare it to other Montessori schools, that they operate, it's significantly smaller. Most of their schools are in that 10 to 15,000 square foot range. So, um, although it's fully booked with, with, uh, you know, no new clientele, the net operating income is great. Just the size of the building, you know, may, may be an issue going forward. And, and we can discuss that a little bit as we, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. What about the, uh, land area? Tyler, how big is, let, the, is the site actually on? Yeah, it's uh, 0 0.58 acres. Yeah, small site. I mean, for a school, yeah. um, this makes me feel like, I know it says it's a new 20-year corporate lease. Um, it makes me feel like this was probably a um, adaptive reuse. Um, it's kind of how yeah. I feel. I don't imagine... They cannot have that much parking. You got a 4,000 square foot building on here. Um, I would say, I don't know, I have not looked at this, but I would argue their parking is probably 20 to 25 uh, max, I would assume, on such a small, <clears throat> small yeah, lot. You're right. It's an adaptive reuse. I don't have the year the original building was built, but it's, it's, it's a, an adaptive reuse uh, end of last year. So, um, I think they basically just were having major success in the school just down the road um, and then opened this one up, you know, just up the street so they can continue to to fill or probably they were overflowing with students and they and they needed to another location to continue. Um, but yeah, basically, um, so let's I mean, let's get into the cash flows. So so this school, um, like I said, lease is starting now. It's a 20 year lease. Uh, they have four or five year options. So if they want to, they, they basically have this uh, under contract for the next 40 years. Um, it is guaranteed by this 100 plus location operator. So, you know, that's uh, a pretty strong guarantee. Um, there's 290,000 in net operating income year one, and they're trying to sell this at a 6.35 cap. So just quickly to put that into perspective, a 6.35 cap, the last guidepost Montessori we looked at in Florida, um, they were selling it at a seven cap. So they're giving this one a, pre, a pretty big premium um, versus the other one we're looking at in Florida, which is also a great community. Um, but they're giving this, you know, a, very, a large premium over another offering uh, that they have. So just keep that in mind, just as a specific uh, comparable sale. Yeah, you know, Tom, I want to comment on that. I think that's probably going to be um a signal to the market that it's in right outside of austin being a very very attractive market right um the market does matter so just because one's trading at you know a seven cap in florida doesn't necessarily mean that that same asset will trade at the same cap rate um in texas right so that does that does matter now i, I will add here uh and i didn't do this on the last one but it looks like they're paying about $65 and change per square foot here. Um, mm -hmm. and, right. So, you know, that's, that's pretty high, um, in comparison, you know, I'm trying to think, 
Um, this got some numbers on, on a similar type use, not exactly. Um, and I do not know what their build out uh, entails, but I think we were at on a brand new build, um, were about $33 in change. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you're looking at almost double, uh, I forget what the land cost is on this deal that I'm talking about, but it's pretty high to me. I mean, that, that list price, excuse me. Yeah. The list price is high because the cap rate is lower on a relatively high NOI. So, you know, I feel like that's a pretty high NOI. Um, yes. I mean, let's, let's, before, before we get into the cash flow, let's talk a little bit more about that. I've, I've got a few charts here. Um, this discuss exactly what you're talking about. So we've got three charts here. Um, this top one is comparable sales by cap rate versus remaining term. And in terms of the cap rate, this, this property is not overpriced, right? You can see the, the orange dot here. It's above kind of the median line of remaining term versus closing cap rate. Um, but if you look down here at, you know, NOI per square foot and closing price per square foot, it's way above, like not even close. Um, most of these properties, you know, they're in that 20 to $30 uh, dollars per square foot as far as NOI per square foot. And they're in that, you know, 400 to 600 uh, as far as closing price per square foot. This property is 60, $65 a square foot uh, NOI and um, over $1,000 in closing price per square foot. So it's way out of the norm versus other you know daycare educational type assets that that even though it's in cedar park super fast growing community amazing community that that i think as well as you winston that that gives me worries you know yeah as it should you know i think my experience is not all investors look at that right i'm some some investors do um you know, and, and, but not all investors. And they say, Hey, I like the brand. I like the market. Let's go. Um, but in a worst case scenario, something happens to guy post, they have to vacate. You just overpaid significantly. Um, who else? Let me retract that statement. Maybe you did not overpay. Um, who else are you going to be able to rent it to at, we'll call it $66 a foot right with yeah. minimal build and and that's, that's going to be tough i can tell you from experience doing um, a, a very similar two very similar concepts that this that would be very tough to do um and so that's my concern i mean that for me this is a big red flag um very big red flag so yeah, you got no, some for crying sure. babies is there <laughs> Yeah. 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 The the joy the joys know. of home the joys of home office. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, let's keep rolling. Yeah, let's roll. So yeah, it's good that we looked at that up front. Um basically, yeah, as you said, so why does that matter, right? It 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 doesn't matter so much when evaluating the lease cash flows. I mean, at the end of, at the end of the day, basically, um, when you evaluate these things, there's three things that matter, right? One, what is what is the lease? That's basically what cash flows are promised to me for the next 20 years, right? Who's the tenant? That's how good is that promise? And then the third thing is, what are you going to do if they leave, right? So that third question, we can't, we're not answering very well because we really, I mean, unless, you know, you know that you're going to be able to get $65 a square foot on whoever's going to come in there if they leave, that third question is just not getting answered very well, right? You're probably going to cut the property value in half if you have to put someone in there at 30 bucks a square foot at a similar cap rate. So you know, is it worth a risk? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but we definitely have to evaluate that risk and include it in the way we, we analyze this investment. Um, so let's real quickly look at this, uh, operating cash flows. We already talked about 290, uh, 290 a year, putting a capital reserve in there because this is a double net plus lease. It's not including roof structure, uh, roof and structure. Um, the rents are increasing 2% a year, which is good. As far as disposition, we're going to use two scenarios. One is we're exiting in year 10. So halfway through the lease, we exit in year 10. We sell it at a 6.85 uh, exit cap, which is 50 basis points above what they're asking to go in. And uh, five basis points a year because the building's going to be older. It's going to be a lease with 10 years instead of 20, et cetera. 
the second scenario, which is what we were basically just talking about, I'm not comfortable with. I doubt that we would get 350,000 uh, NOI. Lit, you know, if we did half that, which is 40 bucks a square foot, your second scenario sucks, right? Your second scenario is a $2 million uh, net disposition instead of a $4.9 million uh, net disposition. So really need to, and in this scenario, really need to evaluate this scenario too, to see, you know, if things go, go sour, um, what am I going to be left with? And what do I think the chances of that are, right? Um, because I mean, there's a, there's a good chance that's not going to happen. I'm using 90% for the scenario that, you know, the tenant stays and 10% that they leave. That might even be a bit aggressive. It could be, you know, 95, five or, or even higher, maybe, um, you know, given the, the operating history of this tenant, the market, uh, the growth of Cedar Park. So the chance of this scenario two happening is probably quite low. But if it does happen, as Espens and I were discussing, like, it's going to be really tough to to keep to maintain the value of the property. Yeah, you know, Tyler, to add a few things to that, I look at this, I, okay, <clears throat> you know, it's already a pretty high, um, I think very high, um, per square foot price, right, annually. I do think it's a strong tenant. I think that they are very strong. However, this is their third location in Cedar Park. If um, if something happens and they have to downsize, I would assume that this would be like the first one to go, right? Yeah. I mean, they would want to maintain you know, just operationally. They want to keep their you know their teachers and 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 their operation as they can. So. I would think in a bad case situation, if they had to go from three to two, which I'm not saying that that's going to be an issue. Um, I think Cedar Park has a very good future. Uh, they may close this one. Or again, if they need to build another one, if they've hit a max on Cedar Park, this one's already uh, uh, sold out, or excuse me, full at full capacity, right? Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. when they open. Yep. So if they open another one, do they then... You know, they build an eight or 14,000 square foot school. Do they then close this one? Right. Um, so those are, you know, those are just some thoughts that are in my mind. Also, you've got the, um, the problem with it being like, it's built out as a school. You know, there's a lot of walls, bathrooms. It's not an open space. This isn't like a Dollar General where you've just got a big space with some shelves on the wall. Right. This is a very, very uh, specific use. And so if you're trying to have it for any other use that is not kind of child related and school related, you're going to have a, a pretty good, um, you know, pretty expensive you know, cost per square foot to, to have to, to do an adaptive reuse. So, you know, there's these are some red flags. I'm harping a little bit on it, so I'll move on. But uh, I just I just want to get those thoughts out. I mean, I agree with you 100%. At the end of the day, if you're going to buy this property, you're going to buy it um, with a very strong assumption that this tenant is not leaving. Because if they leave, it's it's bad news. And and not only do you have to um, add that, you know, that, that scenario into the probability estimate. So, you know, you have a weighted, if you look here, right, like the way this is working. Um, you have a 90% estimate that you know, you're going to exit with 4.9 million and a 10% estimate that you're going to exit with 2 million. And then, you know, your net average is 4.6. Fine. It's a low probability, but the, the, because that probability exists so that you could be exiting at 2 million, you have to be prepared for that. If you're not prepared for that, don't buy this property, right? You have to, you have to, you, you buy this property. If you really believe the tenant's not going to leave, but even if they do, you'll be okay with that. If you're not okay with 2 million exiting 10 years from now, you don't buy this property because that's probably what you're going to get if they leave. So just just be be prepared for worst case scenario. Um, make sure you know what the worst case scenario is before you before you get in, even if it doesn't affect your um, estimated your estimated return that much. It does. It does affect your downside uh, standard deviation a lot. So, you know, be careful with that. Hey, Tyler, quick question I have for you is how long until I'm break even with this asset? You know, it's got Let's have a 2% annual increase, which is very attractive. You know, we, we like those, but um, how long until 
you know, my purchase price, I'm, I'm break even uh, on the, I basically I've paid off the building. Good question. Um, I don't know if I want to program that up. I don't have, I don't have a quick uh, button for that right here. I'd have to actually do, do it manually. Um, well, that's fine. We don't have to talk about that, but let's add that for future reference. Um, yeah. Just kind of how long it would be, how many, uh, how many payments, and when we Problem. hit break even on the purchase of that property. You know, because you know, one thing that we we've never really highlighted is, is that once you own the property free and clear, and the market shifts, and you've got to t maybe take less rent than what you. You, you had before, you own it free and clear, right? The problem, the real problem is that when most people use leverage and they owe the bank money and you underwrite it, not thinking that, that, that this tenant's going to pay you every month for the next 20 years. And then, in, you know, um, in year seven, they have to vacate. And so now you're stuck owing the bank. That's a bad situation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we'll, yeah, we'll looking, add that. For just, just looking at these cash flows, just doing the math in my head, it's about, around year 15. You'd be, you'd be cash flow even 14, 14 to 15. Okay. So to get your money back, assuming you, assuming you, uh, you know, you were in for a uh, 50%, 50% loan, you know, you, you're in for 2.3 million. You'd have that 2.3 back in like 15, in about 15 years. Actually it'd be, it'd be the same for levered or un unlevered because the levered and unlevered IRR in this case is almost identical. So you'd, you'd be about 15 years to get your money back and then you're, and then you're in the clear. Yeah. Um, I think we've, we've discussed this enough that, you know, this, this case buying it at this cap rate isn't, doesn't appear to be a, a, a very attractive uh, a deal. What, you know, if we want to look at it and actually discount these cash flows in a way that we think makes sense, um, we can come up with a cap rate that we think think does make sense. Um, I've put two discount rates here: one eight percent for the income cash flows, which could even be a bit conservative. I think the income cash flows are actually very good from this from this tenant in this market. Um, but I'm using ten percent as a dis, as a disposition cash flow discount rate because the disposition is what scares me. It's the it's the chance that if this tenant leaves, um, you know what am what am I left with? So if I use 8% and 10%, and honestly, 8% might even be conservative. I use 7 and 10%. Um, and you can see how that compares to corporate bonds up there, right? So I'm, I'm actually giving this tenant a similar cash flow rating as a double B corporate bond, right? So that's, that's pretty good. Um, we should be buying this thing at about a 7.56 cap, you know, if we discount the cash flows at those rates. So, you know, that's significantly uh, cheaper than what they're asking, uh, 6.35 yeah. is what they're asking. So we're over, you know, 120 basis points um, difference because we're scared of, uh, we're scared of retenanting. So we're pricing in our fear. Yeah, you know, I don't even know if I'm a buyer at that price, right? Um, for me, the NOI that they have on it today is, is, is too high. Um, you know, I think the building is, now, it's not too small, but I think it's a little too small for their use. Um, the, the size of the property, which is only 0.58 acres, is very small. I mean, it, it's it's hard to even get a QSR um, on that property, you know, um, something like that. You may be able to get one of the new just drive through only type, um, you know, type concepts on there. But you, you've got a really small land area. Um I'm not 100% sure like where it's located, if it's even in a retail area, but I'm not a buyer on this one. Uh, when, when I first thought about it, I, I thought, yeah, this is great. Cedar Park, great brand, great operating company. But I just think, I think the NOI is too high and I think the, the land's too small and I don't like, uh, this wasn't a build a suit for them um, and it's showing in the numbers. Um, so that's that's where I'm at, man. And and what I you, think that you say what? I say what? What would you pay for it? You pay if it was if it was a uh, hundred thousand bucks, you'd buy it. Good point. Um, you know, I think in this case, I'd have to be at like an eight and a half cap, 
right? So I'm not even in the conversation with them. I don't, you know, going to eight and a half from a, a six and three five. And the reason why I'm saying eight and a half, it has nothing to do with the market. The market's great, but I feel like all the upside of the market is is being captured right now. I don't think that that the upside is there, right? So if I could pay eight and a half cap on two hundred ninety thousand NOI then okay fine 290 noi but i got it at a high cap rate what you know what can i do in the future will cap rates compress or, or whatever what can i do to improve it to then resell it um at a lower cap rate that's really hard to do in in that lease investing it's not you know it's not common it happened during covid um but it's not common so that's why i'm saying i'm not really a buyer on this. I think the risk is is greater than the reward because yeah, I'd buy for 100k, but at eight and a half cap, we're still looking at probably three million, right? And um, I don't know, man, three million for a company who's clearly this isn't their their prototype and mm -hmm. have very 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 limited reuses. But stuff. I don't think I, I can get comfortable tough. with it. It's now tough. it's tough to eat I that think down. They're... It's that downside risk. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was just I just had who 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 could buy this is someone who could lose a couple million dollars, right? So you know, I, I think on one of our one of the uh, next videos we do, I should do a Monte Carlo analysis uh, and look at the the return as a distribution rather than a point estimate, right? So we talk about you know what's the expected return on this asset. It looks okay. But that doesn't show us exactly how much is the downside risk, right? So if you have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, and this is just one property that you own, um, and you're and you like the property, you think it won't go under, um, but you're able, you're willing and able to take the that downside where you have to sell it at two million after paying, you know, five million for it. Um, that's an investor that can take this. If you're a smaller investor, you've maybe got, you know, five million, ten million, ten million bucks or less. Um, and this would kill you if this happened. Then, you know, then you get into the conversation we're having right now, where even at an eight and a half cap, it's not that nice. You know, so really, um, when you have situations like this, where there's a where there's a, where there's a real possibility of a big downside, um, it's really just about how big is your bankroll in comparison to the, you know, how where does this fit into your portfolio? How big is your bankroll in comparison to this asset? And and can you can you eat that loss should it happen? Right. It's like the old poker player, like never play with all your chips. Even if you're even if you're positive, you have to play with you know one percent of your chips or whatever. Yeah, yeah, good point, and um, totally, totally relevant. I, I think uh, it, there is a buyer for this. There is a buyer for it, but it's not me. <laughs> yeah, me either. All right, that cool. was good. That was a good conversation. I think there was a lot to unpack there. I think for this one because it's very attractive. Um, on the surface. So anything else you want to add? That's it, man. Well, cool. Well, uh, appreciate it. If anyone out there is interested in learning more about single tenant net leases or single tenant net lease investing, give us a shout. We're happy to discuss it at any time. Thanks, Tyler. I'll talk to you next week. All right. Cheers, Winston. Cheers.